Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of Casual Audio Papers uh, with Ms. Elias Kanani. Today we're going to continue reading the first voyage, uh, Christopher Columbus's journal. Again, because I am really curious to know what his character is, character is when compared to the sort of political space. And uh, so far we're on Tuesday, the 16th of October. So, let's get started. I sailed from the island of Santa Maria de la Concepcion at about noon to go to Fernandina Island, which appeared very large to the westward, and I navigated all that day with light winds. I could not arrive in time to be able to see the bottom so as to drop the anchor on a clear place, for it is necessary to be very careful not to lose the anchor, not to lose the anchor. So I stood off and on all that night until day. When I came to an inhabited place where I anchored, and whence that man had come that I found yesterday in the canoe in mid-channel, he had given such a good report of us that there was no want of canoes alongside the ship all that night, which brought us water and what they had to offer. I ordered each one to be given something, such as a few beads, ten or twelve of those made of glass on a thread, some timbrels made of brass, such as are worth uh, Mara, Maraveda, Maravedi in Spain, and some straps, all which they looked upon as most excellent. I also ordered them to be given a uh, treacle to eat when they came on board. At three o'clock I sent the ship's boat on shore for water, and the natives with good will showed my people where the water was and they themselves brought the full casks down to the boat and did all they could to please us. This island is very large, and I have determined to sail around it, because, so far as I can understand, there is a mine in or near it. The island is eight leagues from Santa Maria, nearly east and west, and this point I had reached, as well as all the coast, trends north-northwest and south-southeast. I saw at least twenty leagues of it, and then it had not ended. Now, as I am writing this, I made sail with the wind at the south to sail round the island and to navigate until I found uh, Samaot, which is the island or, or city where there is gold, as all the natives say who are on board, and as those of San Salvador and Santa Maria told us. These people resemble those of the said islands, with the same language and customs, except that these appear to me a rather more domestic and tractable people, yet also more subtle, for I observe that those who brought cotton and other trifles to the ship knew better than the others how to make a bargain. In this island I saw cotton clo cloth made like mantles, the people were be better disposed, and the women wore in front of their bodies a small piece of cotton which scarcely covered them. It is a very green island, level and very fertile, and I have no doubt that they sow and gather corn all the year round, as well as other things. I saw many trees very unlike those of our country. Many of them have their branches growing in different ways, and all from one trunk, and one twig in one form, and another in a different shape and so unlike that it is the greatest wonder in the world to see the great diversity. Thus, one branch has leaves like those of a cane, and others like those of a mastic tree. And on a single tree there are five or six different kinds. Nor are these grafted, for it may be said that grafting is unknown, the trees being wild and untended by these people. They do not know any religion, and I believe they could easily be converted to Christianity for they are very intelligent. Here the fish are so unlike ours that it is wonderful. Some are the shape of dories and of the finest colors in the world, blue, yellow, red, and other tints, all painted in various ways. And the colors are so bright that there is not a man who would not be astonished and would not take great delight in seeing them. There are also whales. I saw no beasts on the land of any kind, except parrots and lizards. A boy told me that he saw a large serpent. I saw neither sheep, nor goat, nor any other quadruped. 
It is true I have been here a short time since noon, yet I could not have failed to see some, uh, some if there had been any. I will write respecting the circuit of this island after I have round it, have been round it. Wednesday, 17th of October. At noon I departed from the village off which I was anchored, and where I took in water, to sail round to this island of Fernandina. The wind was southwest and south. My wish was to follow the coast of this island to the southeast, from where I was, the whole coast trending north-northwest and south-southeast, because all the Indians I bring with me and others made signs to this southern quarter as the direction of the island they call Samoet, where the gold is. Martin Alonso Pinzon, captain of the Caravel Pinta, on board of which I had three of the Indians, came to me and said that one of them had given him to understand very positively that the island might be sailed round much quicker by shaping a north-northwest course. I saw that the wind would not help me to take the course I desired, and that it was fair for the other, uh, so I made sail to the north-northwest. When I was two leagues from the cape of the island, I discovered a very wonderful harbor. It has been one mouth, or rather it may be said to have two, for there is an islet in the middle. Both are very narrow, and within it is wide enough for a hundred ships, if there was depth and a clean bottom, and the entrance was deep enough. It seemed desirable to explore it and take soundings, so I anchored outside and went in with all the ship's boats when we saw there was insufficient depth. As I thought, when I first saw it, that it was the mouth of some river, I ordered the water casks to be brought. On shore I found eight or ten men, who presently came to us and showed us the village, whither I sent the people for water, some with arms and others with casks, and, as it was some little distance, I waited two hours for them. During that time I walked among the trees, which was the most beautiful thing I had ever seen beholding as much verdure as in the month of May in Andalusia. The trees are as unlike ours as day from night, as are from fruits, the herbs, the stones, and everything. It is true that some of the trees bore some resemblance to those in Castile, but most of them are very different, and some were so unlike that, uh, that no one could compare them to anything in Castile. The people were all like those already mentioned, like them, naked, and the same size. They give what they possess in exchange for anything that may be given to them. I here saw some of the ship's boys bartering broken bits of glass and crockery for darts. The men who went for water told me that they had been in the houses of the natives, and that they were very plain and clean inside. Their beds and bags for holding things were like nets of cotton. The houses are like booths, and very high, with good chimneys. But among many villages that I saw, there was none that consisted of more than f from twelve to fifteen houses. Here they found that the married women wore clouts of cotton, but not the young girls, except a few who were over eighteen years of age. They had dogs, uh, so Columbus did not see these dogs, but only heard of them from his men. Las Casas tells us that they were a kind of dog that never barks. Huh, interesting. They, they had dogs, mastiffs, and hounds. And here they found a man who had a piece of gold in his nose, the size of half a castellano, on which they saw letters. I quarreled with these people because they uh, would not exchange or give what, he, what was required, as I wished to see what and whose this money was, and they replied that they were not accustomed to barter. After the water, water was taken, I returned to the ship, made sail, and shaped a course northwest, until I had discovered all the part of the coast of the island which trends east to west. Then all the Indians turned round and said that this island was smaller than Samoet, and that it would be well to return back so as to reach it sooner. The wind presently went down, and then sprang up from west-northwest, which was contrary 
for us to continue on the previous course, so I turned back and navigated all that night to east-southeast, sometimes to east and to southeast. This course was so steered to keep me clear of the, of the land, for there were very heavy clouds and thick weather, which did not admit of my approaching the land to anchor. On that night, it rained very heavily from midnight until nearly dawn, and even afterwards the clouds threatened rain. We found ourselves at the southwest end of the island, where I hoped to anchor until it cleared up, so as to see the other island whither I have to go. On all these days, since I arrived in these Indies, it, was rain it has rained more or less. Your Highnesses may believe that this land is the best and most fertile, and with a good climate, level, and as good as there is in the world. Thursday, 18th of October. After it had cleared up, I went before the wind, approaching the island as near as I could, and anchored when I was no longer light enough to keep under sail, but I did not go on shore and made sail at dawn. Friday, 19th of October. I weighed the anchors at daylight, sending the caravel Pinta on an east-southeast course, the caravel Nina south-southeast, while I shaped a southeast course, giving orders that these courses were to be steered until noon, and that then the two caravels should alter course so as to join company with me. Before we had sailed for three hours, we saw an island to the east, for which uh, we steered and all three vessels arrived at the north point before noon. Here there is an islet and a, and a reef of rocks to seaward of, to seaward of it, to seaward of it, besides one between the islet and the large island. The men of San Salvador, whom I bring with me, called it some, uh, Salmete, and I gave it the name of Isabella. The wind was north, and the said islet bore from the island of Fernandina, whence I had taken my departure, east and west. Afterwards, we ran along the coast of the island, westward from the islet, and found its length to be twelve leagues as far as a cape, which I named Cabo Herma, uh, Hermoso, at the western end. The islet is beautiful, and the coast very deep, without sunken rocks off it. Outside the shore is rocky, but further in there is a sandy beach, and here I anchored on that Friday night until morning. This coast and the part of the islet I saw is almost flat, and the island is very beautiful, for if the other islands are lovely, this is more so. It has many very green trees, which are very large. The land is higher than, than in the other islands, and in it there are some hills which cannot be called mountains and it appears that there is much water inland. From this point to the northeast, the coast makes a great angle, and there are many thick and extensive groves. I wanted to go and anchor there, so as to go on shore and see so much beauty, but the water was shallow, and we could only anchor at a distance from the land. The wind also was fair for going to this cape, where I, where I am now anchored, to which I gave the name of Cabo Hermoso, because it is so. Thus it was that I do not anchor in that angle, but as I saw this cape so green and so beautiful, like all the other lands of these islands, I scarcely knew which to visit first, for I can never tire my eyes in looking at such lovely vegetation, so different from ours. I believe that there are many herbs and many trees that are worth much in Europe for dyes and for medicines. But I do not know, and this causes me great sorrow. Arriving at this cape, I found the smell of the trees and flowers so delicious that it seemed the pleasantest thing in the world. Tomorrow, before I leave this place, I shall go on shore to see what there is at this cape. There are no people, but there are villages in the interior, where the Indians I bring with me say there is a king who has much gold. Tomorrow I intend to go so far inland as to find the village and see and have some speech with this king, who, according to the signs they make, rules over all the neighboring islands, goes about clothed, and wears much gold on his person. 
I do not give much faith to what they say as well because I do not understand them as because they are so poor in gold that even a little that this king may have would appear much to them. This cape, to which I have given the name of Cabo Formoso, is, I believe, on an island separated from Salmeto, and there is another small islet between them. I did not try to examine them in detail because I could not be because it could not be done in fifty years, for my desire is to see and discover as much as I can before returning to your Highnesses, our Lord willing, in April. It is true that in the event of finding places where there is gold or spices in quantity, I should stop until I had collected as much as I could. I therefore proceed in the hope of coming across such places. Saturday, 20th of October. Today at sunrise I weighed the anchors from where I was with the ship and anchored off the southwest point of the island of Salmeto, to which I gave the name Cabo de la Laguna, and to the island Isabella. My intention was to navigate to the northeast and east from the southeast and south, where I understood from the Indians I brought with me was the village of the king. I found the sea so shallow that I could not enter nor navigate in it, and I saw that to follow a route by the southeast would be a great round. So I determined to return by the route that I had taken from the north-northeast to the western part, and to sail around this island, too. Uh, there's a word missing in the manuscript. Navarrete suggests reconocerla. Quote, I had so little wind that I never could sail along the coast, except during the night as it was dangerous to anchor off these islands except in the day, when one can see where to, where to let go the anchor, for the bottom is all in patches, some clear and some rocky. I lay to all this Sunday night. The Carvels anchored because they found themselves near the shore, and they thought that, owing to the signals that they were in the habit of making, I would come to anchor, but I did not wish to do so. Sunday 21st of October. At 10 o'clock, I arrived here off this islet, uh, Bird Rock, where he was on the 19th, and anchored, as well as on the caravels. After breakfast, I went on shore and found only one house, in which there was no one, and I suppose they had fled from fear, because all their property was left in the house. I would not allow anything to be touched, but set out with the captain and people to explore the island. If the others already seen are very beautiful, green and fertile, this is much more so, with large trees and very green. Here there are large lagoons with wonderful vegetation on their banks. Throughout the island all is green, and the herbage like April in Andalusia. The songs of the birds were so pleasant that it seemed as if a man could never wish to leave the place. The flocks of parrots concealed the sun, and the birds were so numerous and of so many different kinds that it was wonderful. There, there are trees of a thousand sorts, and all have their several fruits, and I feel the most unhappy man in the world not to know them, for, for I am well assured that they are all valuable. I bring home specimens of them and also of the land. Thus walking along round one of the lakes, I saw a serpent, an iguana, which we killed, and I bring home the skin for your highnesses. As soon as it saw us, it went into the lagoon, and we followed, as the water was not very deep until we killed it with lances. It is seven palmos long, and I believe that there are many like it in these lagoons. Here I came upon some aloes, and I have determined to take ten quintals on board tomorrow, for they tell me that they are worth a good deal. Also, while in search of good water, we came to a village about half a league from our anchorage. The people, as soon as they heard us, all fled and left their houses, hiding their property in the wood. I would not allow a thing to be touched, even the value of a pin. Presently, some men among them came to us, and one came quite close. I gave him some bells and glass beads, which made him very content and happy. 
that our friendship might be further increased, I resolved to ask him for something. I requested him to get some water. After I had gone on board, the natives came to the beach with uh, calabashes full of water, and they delighted much in giving it to us. I ordered another string of glass beads to be presented to them, and they said they would come again tomorrow. I wished to fill up all the ships with water at this place, and if there should be time, I intended to search the island until I had uh, had speech with the king, and seen whether he had the gold of which I had heard. I shall then shape a course for another much larger island, which I believe to be Kipango, judging from the six signs made by the Indians I bring with me. They call it Cuba, and they say that there are ships and many skillful sailors there. Beyond this island, there is another called Bocio, or Bohil, which they also say is very large, and others we shall see as we pass, lying between. According as I obtain tidings of gold or spices, I shall settle what should be done. I am still resolved to go to the mainland and, and the city of uh, Guise, a flourishing port of China, mentioned in the letter of uh, Toscanelli and more fully described by Marco Polo, who calls it Kinse, and to deliver the letters of your highnesses to the Grand Can, requesting a reply and returning with it. Monday, 22nd of October. All last night and today I was here, waiting to see if the king or other person would bring gold or anything of value. Many of these people came, like those of the other islands, equally naked and equally painted, some white, some red, some black, and others in many ways. They brought darts and skeins of cotton to barter, which they exchanged with the sailors for bits of glass, broken crockery, and pieces of earthenware. Some of them had pieces of gold fastened in their noses, which they willingly gave for a hawk's bell and a glass bead. But there was so little that it counts for nothing. It is true that they looked upon any little thing that I gave them as a wonder, and they held our arrival to be a great marvel, believing that we came from heaven. We got water for the ships from a lagoon which is near the Cado del Isleo, Cape of the Islet, as we named it. In the said lagoon, Mar Martin Alonso Pinzon, captain of the Pinta, killed another serpent, seven palmos long, like the one we got yesterday. I made them gather here as much of the aloe as they could find. Tuesday, 23rd of October. I desired to set out today for the island of Cuba, which I think must be Kipango, according to the signs these people make, indicative of its size and riches, and I did not delay any more here, nor, uh, there's a gap in the manuscript, round this island to the residence of this king our lord, king or lord, and have speech with him, as I have intended. This would cause me much delay, and I see that there is no gold mine here. To sail round would need several winds, for it for it does not blow here as men may wish. It is better to go where there is great entertainment, so I say that it is not reasonable to wait, but rather to continue the voyage and inspect much land, until some very profitable country is reached, my belief being that it will be rich in spices. That I have no personal knowledge of these products causes me the greatest sorrow in the world, for I see a thousand kinds of trees each one with its own special fruit, all green now as in Spain during the months of May and June, as well as a thousand kinds of herbs with their flowers. Yet I know none of them except this aloe, of which I ordered a quantity to be brought on board to bring to your highnesses. I have not made sail for Cuba because there is no wind, but a dead calm uh, with much rain. It rained a great deal yesterday without causing any cold. On the contrary, the days are hot and the nights are cool, like May in Andalusia. Wednesday, 24th of October. At midnight, I weighed the anchors and left the anchorage at Cabo del Isleo, in the island of Isabella, from the northern side, where I was. I intended to go to the island of Cuba, 
where I heard of the people who are very great and had gold, spices, merchandise, and large ships. They showed me that the course thither would be west-southwest, and so I hold. For I believe that it is so, as all the Indians of these islands, as well as those I brought with me in the ships, told me by signs. I cannot understand their language, but I believe that it is of the island of Kipongo that they recount these wonders. On the spheres I saw uh, the globe of Martin uh, Behane, made in 1492. On the spheres I saw, and on the delineations of the map of the world, uh, Kipongo is in this region. So I shaped a course west-southwest until daylight, but at, but at dawn all fell calm and began to rain, and went on nearly all night. I remained thus with little wind until the afternoon, when it began to blow fresh. I set all the sails in the ship, and mainsail with two bonnets, the foresail, spritsail, mizzen, uh, main topsail, and the boat sail on the poop. So I proceeded until nightfall, when the Cabo Verde on the island of Fernandina, which is at the southwest end, bore northwest distant seven leagues. As it was now blowing hard, and I did not know how far it, would, uh, it was to this island of Cuba, I resolved not to go in search of it during the night. All these islands being very steep to, uh, steep to, with no bottom round them for a distance of two shots of a, of a lombard. The bottom is all in patches, one bit of sand and another of rock, and for this reason it is not safe to anchor without inspection with the eye, so I determined to take, to take in all the sails except the foresail and to go on under that re uh, reduced canvas. Soon the wind increased, while the route was doubtful, and there was very thick weather with rain. I ordered the foresail to be furled, and we did not make two leagues during the night. Thursday, 25th of October. Quote, I steered west-southwest from after sunset until nine o'clock, making five leagues. Afterwards, I altered course to west and went eight miles an hour until one in the afternoon, and from that time until three, I made good 44 miles. Thin land was sighted, consisting of seven or eight islands, the group running north and south, distant from us five leagues. Friday, 26th of October. The ship was on the south side of the island, which were all low, distant five or six leagues. I anchored there. The Indians on board said that uh, thence to Cuba was a voyage in their canoes of a day and a half, these being small dugouts without a sail, which are their canoes. I departed thence for Cuba, for by the signs the Indians made of its greatness and of its gold and pearls, I thought that it must be Kipongo. Saturday, 27th of October. I weighed from these islands at sunrise and gave them the name of Las Islas de Arena, owing to the little depth the sea had for a distance of six leagues to the southward of them. We went eight miles an hour on a south-southwest course until one o'clock, having made 40 miles. Until night, we had run 28 miles on the same course, and before dark, the land was sighted. At night, there was much rain. The vessels on Saturday until sunset made 17 leagues on a south-southwest course. Sunday, 28th of October. I went thence in search of the island of Cuba on a south-southwest coast, making for the nearest point of it and entering a very beautiful river without danger of sunken rocks or other impediments. All the coast was clear of dangers up to the shore. The mouth of the river was twelve uh, branos across, and it is wide enough for a vessel to beat in. I anchored about a, la a Lombard shot, shot inside. The admiral says that he never beheld such a beautiful place, with trees bordering the rivers, handsome, green, and different from ours, having fruits and flowers, each one according to its nature. 
There are many birds which sing very sweetly. There are a great number of palm trees of a different kind from those in Guinea and from ours, of a mid, uh, middling height, the trunks without that covering, and the leaves very large, in which they, they thatch their houses. The country is very level." End quote. The admiral jumped into his boat and went on shore. He came to two houses, which he believed to belong to fishermen who had fled from fear. In one of them he found a kind of dog that never barks, and in both there were nets of palm fiber and cordage, as well as horn fish hooks, bone harpoons, and other apparatus, quote, for fishing and several hearths. He believed that many people lived together in one house. He gave orders that nothing in the houses should be touched, and so it was done, end quote. The herbage was, a th was as thick as in Andalusia during April and May. He found much purslan and wild amaram. He returned to the boat and went up the river for some distance, and he says it was great pleasure to see the bright verdure and the birds which he could not leave to go back. He says that this island is the most beautiful that eyes have seen, full of good harbors and deep rivers and the sea appeared as if it never rose, for the herbage on the beach nearly reached the waves, which does not happen where the sea is rough. Up to that time they had not experienced a rough sea among all those islands. He says that the island is full of very beautiful mountains, although they are not very extensive as regards length, but, but high, and all the country is high with, like Sicily. It is abundantly supplied with water, as they gathered from the Indians they had taken with them from the island of Guanahani. These said by signs that there are ten great rivers, and that they cannot go around the island in twenty days. When they came near land with the ships, two canoes came out, and when they saw the sailors get into a boat and row about to find the depth of the river where they could anchor, the canoes fled. The Indians say that in this island there are gold mines and pearls, and the admiral saw a likely place for them and mussel shells, which are signs for them. He understood that large ships of the Grand Can came here, and that from here to the mainland was a voyage of ten days. The admiral called this river and harbor San Salvador. Porto Naranjo, Nipe, according to Navaretta. Monday, 29th of October. The Admiral weighed anchor from this port and sailed to the westward to go to the city, where, as it seemed, the Indians had, the Indians said that there was a king. They doubled a point six leagues to, to the northwest, and then another point, then east ten leagues. After another league, he saw a river with no very large entrance, to which he gave the name of Rio de la Luna. He went on until the hour of Vespers. He saw another river much larger than the others, as the Indians told him by signs, and near he saw goodly villages of houses. He called the river Rio de Mares. He sent two boats on shore to a village to communicate, and one of the Indians he had brought with him, for now they understood a little and showed themselves content with Christians. All the men, women, and children fled, abandoning their houses with all they contained. The admiral gave orders that nothing should be touched. The houses were better than those he had seen before, and he believed that the houses would improve as he approached the mainland. They were made like booths, very large, and looking like tents in a camp without regular streets, but one here and another there, where, th where they were clean and well swept and the furniture well made. All are of palm branches, beautifully constructed. They found many images in the shape of women and many heads like masks, very well carved. It was not known whether these were used as ornaments or to be worshipped. They had dogs which never bark and wild birds tamed in their houses. There was a wonderful supply of nets and other fishing implements, but nothing was touched. He believed that all the people on the coast were fishermen who took the fish inland, for this island is very large and so beautiful 
that he is never tired of praising it. He says that he found trees and fruits in very marvelous taste, and adds that they must have cows or other cattle, for he saw skulls which were like those of cows. The songs of the birds and the chirping of crickets throughout the night lulled everyone to rest, while the air was soft and healthy, and the nights neither hot nor cold. On the voyage through the other islands there was great heat, but here it is tempered like the month of May. He attributed the heat of the other islands to their flatness, and to the wind coming from the east, which is hot. The water of the river was salt at the mouth, and they did not know whence the natives got their drinking water, though they have sweet water in their houses. Ships are able to turn in this river, both entering and coming out, and there was very good leading marks. He says that all this sea appears to be constantly smooth, like the river at Serville, and the water suitable for the growth of pearls. He found large shells unlike those of Spain, remarking on the position of the river and port, to which he gave the name of San Salvador. He describes its mountains as lofty and beautiful, like the Pena de las uh, Enamoradas, and one of them has another little hill on its summit, like a graceful mosque. The other river and port in which he now was has two round mountains to the southwest and a fine low cape running out to the west-southwest. Tuesday, 30th of October. He left the Rio de Mares and steered northwest, seeing a cape covered with palm trees, to which he gave the name of Cabo de Palmas, after having made good fifteen leagues, the Indians on board the Caravel Pinta said that beyond that cape there was a river, and that from the river to Cuba it was four days' journey. The captain of the Pinta reported that he understood from that that this Cuba was a city, and that the land was a great continent trending far to the north. The king of that country, he gathered, was at war with the Grand Can, whom they called Calmi. Cami? Kami, something like that, and in his land or city, Fava, with many other names. The admiral resolved to proceed to that river and to send a present with the letter of the sovereigns to the king of that land. For that service, for this service, there was a sailor who had been to Guinea, and some of the Indians of Guanahani wished to go with him, and afterwards to return to their homes. The admiral calculated that he was 42 degrees to the north of the equinoctial line, but the handwriting is here illegible. He says that he must attempt to. Uh, he says that he must attempt to reach the Grand Can, who he thought was here or at the city of Cathay, which belongs to him and is very grand, as he was informed before leaving Spain. All this land, he adds, is low and beautiful, and the sea deep. Wednesday, 31st of October. All Tuesday night he was beating to windward, and he saw a river, but could not enter it because the entrance was narrow. The Indians fancied that the ships could enter wherever their canoes could go. Navigating onwards, he came to a cape running out very far and surrounded by sunken rocks and he saw a bay where small vessels might take shelter. He could not proceed because the wind had come round to the north, and all the coast runs northwest and southeast. Another cape further on ran out still more. For these reasons, and because the sky showed signs of a gale, he had to return to the Rio de Mares. Thursday, November the 1st. At sunrise, the admiral sent the boats on shore to the houses that were there, and they found that all the people had fled. After some time, a man made his appearance. The admiral ordered that he should be left to himself, and the sailors returned to the boats. After dinner, one of the Indians on board was sent on shore. He called out from a distance that there was nothing to fear, because the strangers were good people and would do no harm to anyone, 
nor were they people of the Grand Can, but they had given away their things in many islands where they had been. The Indian then swarm, swam on shore, and two of the natives took him by the arms and brought him to a house, where they heard what he had to say. Then they were certain that no harm would be done to them. Uh, when they were certain that no harm would be done to them, they were reassured, and presently more than sixteen canoes came to the ship with cotton thread and other trifles. The admiral ordered that nothing should be taken from them, that they might understand that he sought for nothing but gold, which they call nuke. Thus they went to and fro between the ships and the shore all day, and they came to the Christians on shore with confidence. The admiral saw no gold whatever among them, but he says that he saw one of them with a piece of worked silver fastened to his nose. They said by signs that within three days many merchant, merchants from England would come to buy the things brought by the Christians, and would give information respecting the king of that land. So far as could be understood from their signs, he resided at a distance of four days' journey. They had sent many messengers in all directions, with news of the arrival of the admiral. These people, says the admiral, are of the same appearance and have the same customs as, as those of the other islands, without any religion so far as I know. For up to this day I have never seen the Indians on board say any prayer, though they repeat the Salve and the Ave Maria and with their hands raised to heaven, and they make the sign of the cross. The language is also the same, and there they are all friends. But I believe that all these islands are at war with the Grand Can, whom they called uh, Kavila, and his province, Bafan. They all go naked like the others. This is what the admiral says. The rivers, he adds, is very deep, and the ships can enter the mouth, going close to the shore. The sweet water does not come within a league of the mouth. It is certain, says the admiral, that this is the mainland, and that I am in front of Zeto and uh, Guinse, a hundred leagues, a little more or less distant, the one from the other. It is very clear that no one before has been so far as this by sea. Yesterday, with wind from the northwest, I found it cold. Friday, 2nd of November. The Admiral decided upon sending two Spaniards, one named Rodrigo de, de Jerez, who lived in Ayamonte, and the other Luis de Torres, who had served in the household of the Adelantado of Murcia, and had been a Jew, knowing Hebrew, Chaldee, and even some Arabic. With these men he sent two Indians, one from among those who had brought from uh, he had brought from Guanahani, and another a native of the houses by the riverside. He gave them strings of beads with which to buy food if they should be in need, and ordered them to return in six days. He gave them specimens of spices to see if any were to be found. Their instructions were to ask for the king of that land, and they were told what to say on the part of the sovereigns of Castile, how they had sent the admiral with letters and a present, to inquire after his health and establish friendship, favoring him in what he might desire from them. They were to collect information respecting certain provinces, ports, and rivers, of which the admiral had notice, and to ascertain their distances from where he was. That night, the admiral took in, at it in altitude with a quadrant and found that the distance from the equinoctial, equinoctial line was 42 degrees. He says that, by his reckoning, he finds that he has gone over 1,142 leagues from the island of Hierro. He still believes that he has reached the, the mainland. Saturday, 3rd of November. In the morning, the admiral got into the boat and as the river is like a, a great lake at the, at the mouth, forming a very excellent port, very deep and clear of rocks, with a good beach for careening ships and plenty of fuel, he explored it until he came to fresh water at a distance of two leagues from the mouth. 
he ascended a small mountain to obtain a view of the surrounding city, uh, the surrounding country, but could see nothing, owing to the dense foliage of the trees, which were very fresh and odoriferous, odoriferous, so that he felt no doubt that there were aromatic herbs among them. He said that all he saw was so beautiful that his eyes could never tire of gazing upon such loveliness, nor his ears of listening to the songs of birds. That day many canoes came to the ships to barter with cotton threads and with the nets in which they uh, sleep, called hamacos. Sunday, 4th of November. At sunrise the admiral again went away in the boat and landed to hunt the birds he had seen the day before. After a time, Martin Alonso Pinzon came to him with two pieces of cinnamon and said that a Portuguese, who was one of his crew, had seen an Indian carrying two very large bundles of it. But he had not bartered for it because of the penalty imposed by the admiral on anyone who bartered. He further said that this Indian carried some brown things like nutmegs the master of the Pinta said that he had found the cinnamon trees. The admiral went to the place and found that they were not cinnamon trees. The admiral showed the Indians some specimens of cinnamon and pepper he had brought from Castile, and they knew it and said by signs that there was uh, plenty in the vicinity, pointing to the southeast. He also showed them gold and pearls, on which certain old men said that there was an infinite quantity in a place called Bohio, and that the people wore it on their necks, ears, arms, and legs, as well as pearls. He further understood them to say that there were great ships and much merchandise all to the southeast. He also understood that far away there were men with one eye and others with dogs' noses who were cannibals and that when they captured an enemy, they beheaded him and drank his blood. Hmm. The admiral then determined to return to the ship and wait for the return of the two men he had sent, intending to depart and seek for those lands, if his envoys brought some good news touching what he desired. The admiral further says, These people are very gentle and timid. They go naked, as I have said, without arms and without law. The country is very fertile. The people have plenty of roots called uh, sanahorias, yams, and with a smell like chestnuts. And they have beans and kinds uh, very different from ours. They also have much cotton, which they do not sow, as it is wild in the mountains and I believe they collect it throughout the year, because I saw pods empty, others full, and flowers all on one tree. There are a thousand other kinds of fruits, which it, it is impossible for me to write about, and all must be profitable. All this, the Admiral says. Monday, 5th of November. This morning, the Admiral ordered the ship to be careened, Afterwards, the other vessels, but not all at the same time. The t two were always to be at the anchorage, as a precaution, although he says that these people were very safe, and that without fear all the vessels might, uh, might have been careened at the same time. Things being in this state, the master of the Nina came to, came to claim a reward from the admiral, because he had found a mastic, but he did not bring the specimens as he had dropped it. The admiral promised him a reward and sent Rodrigo Sanchez and Master Diego to the trees. They collected some, which was kept to present to the sovereigns, as well as the tree. The admiral says that he knew it was mastic, though it, was, though it ought to be gathered at the proper season. There is enough in that district for a yield of 1,000 quintals every year. The admiral also found here a great deal of the plant called aloe. He further says that the Porto de Mares is the best in the world, with the finest climate and the most gentle people. As it, was, as it has a high rocky cape, a fortress might be built, so that in the event of the place becoming rich and important, the merchants would be safe from any other nation. He adds, 
The Lord, in whose hands are all victories, will ordain all things for his service. An Indian said by signs that the mastic was good for pain in the stomach. Hmm. Tuesday, 6th of November. Yesterday at night, says the Admiral, the two men came back who had been sent to explore the interior. They said that after walking 12 leagues, they came to a village of 50 houses where there were, th where there were a thousand inhabitants, for many live in one house. These houses are like very large booths. They said that they were received with great solemnity, according to custom, and all, both men and women, came out to see them. They were lodged in the best houses, and the people touched them, kissing their hands and feet, marveling and believing that they came from heaven, and so they gave them to understand. They gave them to eat of what they had. When, when they arrived, the chief people conducted them by the arms of the principal house, gave them two chairs on which to sit, and all the natives sat round them on the ground. The Indian who came with them described the manner of living of the Christian, and said that they were good people. Presently the men went out, and the women came sitting round them in the same way, kissing their hands and feet, and looking to see if they were of flesh and bone like themselves. They begged the Spaniards to remain with them at least five days. Spaniards showed the natives specimens of cinnamon, pepper, and other spices which the admiral had given them, and they said by signs that there was plenty at a short distance from thence to southeast, but that there they did not know whether there was any. Finding that they had no information respecting cities, the Spaniards returned, and if they had desired to take those who wished to accompany them, more than 500 men and women would have come because they thought the Spaniards were returning to heaven. There came, however, a principal man of the village and his son with a servant. The admiral conversed with them and showed them much honor. They made signs respecting many lands and islands to the sovereigns. He says that he knew not what fancy took them. Either from fear or owing to the dark night, they wanted to land. The ship was at the same, or the ship was at the time high and dry, but not wishing to to make them angry, he let them go on their, saying that they would return at dawn. But they never came back. The two Christians met with many people on the road going home, men and women with a half burnt weed in their hands, being the herbs they are accustomed to smoke. They did not find villages on the road of more than five houses all receiving them with the same reverence. They saw many kinds of trees, herbs, and sweet-smelling flowers, and birds of many different kinds, unlike those of Spain, except the partridges, geese, of which there are many, and singing nightingales. They saw no quadrupeds except the dogs that do not bark. The land is very fertile and is cultivated with yams and several kinds of beans, different from ours, as well as corn. There were great quantities of cotton gathered, spun, and worked up. In a single house they saw more than 500 arabos, and as much as 4,000 quintals could be yielded every year. The admiral said that it did not appear to be cultivated, and that it bore all the, all the year round. It is very fine and has a large bowl. All that was possessed by these people they gave at a very low price, and a great bundle of cotton was exchanged for, uh, for the point of a needle or other trifle. They are, they are a people, says the admiral, guileless and unwarlike. Men and women go as naked as when their mothers bore them. It is true that the women wear a very small rag of cotton cloth, and they are very good they are of very good appearance, not very dark, less so than the Canarians. I hold most serene princes that if devout religious persons were here, knowing the language, they would all turn Christian. I trust in our Lord that your highnesses will resolve upon this with much diligence, to bring so many great nations within the church and to convert them, as you have destroyed those who would not confess the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. 
And after your days, all of us being mortal, may your kingdom remain in peace and free from heresy and evil. And may you be well received before the eternal creator, to whom I pray that you may have long life and great increase of kingdoms and lordships with the will and disposition to increase the holy Christian religion as you have done hitherto. Amen. Today I got the ship afloat and prepared to depart on Thursday in the name of God and to steer southeast in search of gold and spices and to discover land. These are the words of the Admiral who intended to depart on, on Thursday, but the wind being contrary, he could not go until the 12th of November. Monday, 12th of November. The Admiral left the port and, and river of Mares before dawn to visit the island called the Babek, uh, the Indians called the Tierra Firma or coast of the mainland, uh, Babek or Karataba. So much talked of by the Indians on board, where according to their signs, the people gather the gold on the beach at night with candles and afterwards beat it into bars with hammers. To go thither, it was necessary to shape a course uh, east b south. After having made eight leagues along the coast, a river was sighted, and another four leagues brought them to another river, which appeared to be a, of great volume, and larger than any they had yet seen. The admiral did not wish to stop, nor to enter in, uh, any of these rivers, for two reasons. The first and principal one being that wind and weather were favorable for going in search of the said island of Barbec, Babec. the other that if there was a populous and uh, famous city near the sea, it would be visible while uh, to go up the river small vessels are necessary, which those of the expedition were not. Much time would thus be lost. Moreover, the exploration of such rivers is a separate enterprise. All that coast was peopled near the river, so that the, so that the name of Rio del Sol was given. The Admiral says that on the previous Sunday, the 11th of November, it seemed good to take some persons from amongst those at Rio de Mares to bring to the sovereigns, that they might learn our language, so as to be able to tell us what there is in their lands. Returning, they would be the mouthpieces of the Christians, and would adopt our customs and the things of the faith. Quote, I saw and knew, says the Admiral, that these people are without any religion, not idolaters, but very gentle, not knowing what is evil, nor the sins of murder and theft, being without arms, and so timid that a hundred uh, would fly before one Spaniard, although they joke with them. They, however... Um, they, however, believe and know that there is a God in heaven, and say that we have come from heaven. At any prayer that we say, they repeat and make the sign of the cross. Thus your highnesses should resolve to make them Christians, for I believe that if the work was begun uh, in a little time, a multitude of nations would be converted to our faith with the acquisition of great lordships, peoples, and riches for Spain. Without doubt, there is in these lands a vast quantity of gold, and the Indians I have on board do not speak without reason when they say that in these islands there are places where they dig out gold, and wear it on their necks, ears, arms, and legs, the rings being very large. There are also precious stones, pearls, and an infinity of spices. In this river of Mares, uh, whence we departed tonight, there is undoubtedly a great quantity of mastic, and much more could be raised, because the trees may be planted, and will yield abundantly. The leaf and fruit are like the mastic, but the tree and leaf are larger. As Pliny describes it, I have seen it on the island of Chios, in the archipelago. I ordered many of these trees to be tapped, to see if any of them would yield resin, but as it rained all the time I was in that river, I could not get any, except a very little, which I am bringing to your highnesses. It may not be the right season for, tra for tapping, which is, I believe, when the trees come forth from
from winter and begin to flower. But when I was there, the fruit was nearly ripe. Here also there is a great quantity of cotton, and I believe it would, be, would have a good sale here without sending it to Spain. But to the great cities of the Grand Can, which will be discovered without doubt, and many others ruled over by other lords, uh, who will be pleased to serve your highnesses, and whither will be brought other commodities of Spain and of the eastern lands. But these are to the west as regards us. There is also here a great yield of aloes, although this is not a commodity that will yield great profit. The mastic, however, is important, for it is only obtained from the island or from the said island of Chios, and I believe the harvest is worth 50,000 ducats, if I remember right. There is here in the mouth of the river the best ports I have seen up to this time, wide, deep, and clear of rocks. It is an excellent site for a town and fort, for any ships could come close up to the walls. The land is high with a temperate climate and very good water. Yesterday a canoe came alongside the ship with six youths in it. Five came on board and, ordered, and I ordered them to be detained. They are now here. I afterwards sent to a house on the western side of the river and seized seven women, old and young, and three children. I did this because the men would behave better in Spain if they had women of their own land than without them. For on many occasions the men of Guinea have been <laughs> brought to learn the language in Portugal, and afterwards, when they returned, and it was expected that they would be useful in their land, owing to the good company they had enjoyed and the gifts they had received, they never appeared after arriving. Others may not act thus. But having women, they have the wish to perform what they are required to do. Besides, the women would teach our people their language, which is the same in all these islands, so that those who make voyages in their canoes are understood everywhere. On the other hand, there are a thousand different languages in Guinea, and one native does not understand another. The same night, the husband of one of the women came alongside in a canoe, who was father of the three children, one boy and two girls. He asked me to let him come with them, and besought me much. They are now all consoled at being with one who is a rel relation to them all. He is a man of about forty-five years of age. All these are the words of the admiral. He also says that he had felt some cold and, and that it would not be wise to continue discoveries in a northerly di direction in the winter. On this Monday until sunset, he steered a course east b south, making eighteen leagues and reaching a cape to which he gave the name of Cabo de Cuba. Okay, let's stop there for now. So, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, a couple things that could be learned from that, I think. Uh, first of all, we talked a little bit about um, the normalcy of sort of... Actually, no, we didn't. We talked a little bit... No. So, uh, one thing to talk about is it's really interesting the... The fact that he is not ransacking all of their houses, that's actually, this seems like a fairly odd thing to do at this time, though I'm not sure if the culture of Spain would have um, been more amenable to such practices. It seems like when Spain sent the conquistadors, they were not quite so uh, nice, I guess. But, you know, that's just from what I know from history. And it might be interesting to uh, do a similar reading of one of their voyages because I've heard mixed reviews on the conquistadors as well. But some things that we can know is that they weren't trying to pillage that seems obvious. They were there to establish a trade route and taking some captives, seizing some of the women, 
uh, in this section, um, I guess was reasonable for them to bring them over uh, to Spain and to uh, um, teach them the language and establishing the trade. So that that's just it's kind of terrible, but it's also kind of funny. They're just like, yeah, well, we're going to teach you the language. Also, we need some women for these men. Go grab those ones. And then, of course, some uh, of the men actually wanted to go, like that 40, was it 45-year-old man? Something like that. So it almost makes me wonder why they couldn't have uh, just taken the men that wanted to go. Like, why did they have to seize them? Why did they have to um, detain them? And all of that. And then some of the ones who ran away, why did... Well, it also would be difficult because you have no idea what they're saying. And so, you know, what are you going to do um, if that's your goal? But still, seems like there's probably should have been a better way to do that. So yeah, I guess we're continuing to see a bit of a complex individual. Uh, Columbus's goal is to bring people back to Spain and show them Spain and teach them the, the religion of Christianity and uh, teach them the language and then bring them back to their hometown. That would be very confusing for the uh, natives of the time, that's for sure. And I'm sure it was confusing for Columbus as well. I, like the entire time that I was thinking about this, I was just trying to think of like what, what it would be like if like just aliens came down and they started trying to communicate with us, like wanting one particular resource with the remote possibility that we might have it and trying to make gestures and then finally at some point uh, we are able to figure out what they want and then show them what it is uh, and where to find it on earth using signs and then they just take some of us and then some people want, think that they're like angels and we're like hey I want to go with you and then some people uh, probably uh, don't want to go with them and all that but all of that would be very confusing and then they go and then uh, if these aliens had the intention of like taking us to wherever their planet is and then teaching us the language and I don't know their greater science or something like that and then uh, bringing us back down to establish some sort of trade it would be really interesting especially like all of these people were completely uh, weaponless and defenseless they could have just taken everybody but it wasn't their goal to take everybody it was their goal to take some people and then bring them back And then there's also the fact that um, Columbus was obviously a Christian from his era. Um, there were heresies. Actually, he would be somebody who would be coming right after the in Inquisition, because the Inquisition was about this time. And so he had that sort of zeal, probably, most likely. And so he then, I suppose, um, thought that it was necessary to make all of these people Christians. And you know, if you are a Christian and you really think that these people are going to go to hell if they don't, it's like, oh, yeah, it is very necessary to teach all these people Christianity. But, yeah, I think I think he continues to be somewhat of a of uh, an ambiguous character. He's definitely not a conquistador. He's not an inquisitor. He's not like a monster at very much at this point. He is probably mostly good, thinks that he's a pretty good person and um, 
wants to do what's best, but these decisions that he's making seem to be mixed. And he's probably trying to figure out how best to go about establishing this trade route and establish, like, right, uh, drawing this map and uh, how best to bring these people back to Spain and then uh, teach them Spanish. But yeah, it doesn't seem like he's a monster quite yet. So with that, I hope everybody had a good Thanksgiving. Um, just, uh, yeah, have a blessed day, and I'll see you guys next time.